According to some, creatures from outer space have been coming to Earth for centuries, bringing with them advanced technology and superior wisdom. Their ships appear to have been caught on film time and time again. And now thousands of Americans claim to have been abducted by aliens and subjected to a horrifying array of procedures. They're so ugly. This is terribly intrusive. People uh, have uh, uh, sperm taken, eggs taken, uh, fetuses uh, implanted in them, removed from them. Scientists don't take reports of alien abduction seriously because there is no physical evidence, and there is no physical evidence because they don't actually exist. Are extraterrestrials really coming to Earth and communicating with us, even interbreeding with us? We examine the most compelling evidence of UFO visitations with believers and skeptics alike. You can see clearly a shining object looks metallic. Much of what people believe about UFOs and alien abductions is, is uh, cultural, it's psychological. It's not out there, it's in here. Science and the supernatural collide in our crowded skies. Contact has been attempted but cannot be established. Instructions are to prepare for an attack by an unknown enemy. For more than 50 years, humans have endured a love-hate relationship with unidentified flying objects and their mysterious alien pilots. But some people think that aliens have been around far longer than we have and may even have influenced our own history. According to some, humans could never have constructed the Great Pyramids of Giza or the giant Nazca Lines of Peru, which only makes sense when viewed from the sky. And if aliens don't exist, how did Iron Age Europeans draw a humanoid in a spacesuit? These creatures, they have found a way to come to the air. They could be more intelligent than we are. Sure, it's possible that aliens came down and helped the ancient Egyptians build the pyramids, but the problem is there's no evidence for this. The assumption that humans aren't smart enough to have figured this out uh, is frankly insulting. UFO researchers, or ufologists, speak of close encounters with visitors from outer space in terms of four kinds. There are close encounters of the first kind, where UFOs are seen at close range, but leave no physical evidence behind. A startling encounter one afternoon in the skies over Mexico falls into this category. In the early afternoon of March 5, 2004, a Mexican military surveillance aircraft was on a routine mission, searching for drug smugglers when its infrared sensing system recorded a sequence of unidentified objects, at one point, as many as 11 of them. These UFOs appeared as bright points of light with no detail or structure. The pilots frantically searched the skies for the objects flying alongside them, but could see nothing even though their infrared system clearly showed something incredibly hot. Air traffic controllers also saw nothing unusual on their radar screens. Finally, the plane landed, with the crew, air traffic control and the military all baffled by what had occurred. We'll examine this kind of encounter later in greater detail. But first, we look at the other types of encounter. Close encounters of the second kind involve UFO sightings which are accompanied by physical evidence of the visit. Many have argued that the famous crop circle phenomenon falls into this category. People often report seeing eerie balls of light over fields of wheat and later find the crops flattened into spectacular formations. Recently, strange circular grass formations in Mexico 
have also been associated with UFO sightings. Then there are the famous close encounters of the third kind. These involve actual contact, often where people speak telepathically to alien beings. And at the far end of the spectrum are those who have had close encounters of the fourth kind, alien abduction. When I regained consciousness, I was on a table. I was on a table. From the beginning, Hollywood loved the idea of aliens from outer space doing unmentionable things to us. But for those who believe they've experienced an abduction, it's no joke. They're so ugly, and they're repulsive. And sometimes I wish I could think, oh, gee, it's a dream. You know, this isn't happening, but it is happening. I had several abductions when I was a child, and very young. They happen very young. It starts from almost cradle to grave. That's, that's the way it goes. Once you're in, in their uh, program, you're in their program forever. Pam is a patient of Dr. David Jacobs, an associate professor of history at Temple University and a leading proponent of the abduction phenomenon. For more than 30 years, he's worked with so-called abductees, using hypnosis to help them regain buried memories of the experience. This is a subject that is the fringe of the fringe, and as an academic to study something like this is, uh, is not a real good career move, shall we say. Um, but one does not have the opportunity to participate in the understanding of a, of a phenomenon of potentially enormous importance uh, very often in one's life. Jacobs believes that at least five million Americans have been abducted by aliens and has heard hundreds of abduction tales, all bearing remarkable similarities. I'm sleeping. I have a sense that the room is very still. Sometimes there's a crispness in it. I don't know how to, to describe that, but th there's a different feeling in the room. And then the sound starts in, in my ear with the mmm, 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 like that, and it goes on. And then I can see a light, and I see figures. Subjects also report that they can't move, as if they're paralyzed. They become aware of someone, or something, approaching them. They levitate and then fly, often directly through a closed window. They're taken into a spacecraft where they join other abductees and await their fate. What happens then is universally horrifying. But a word of caution to anyone who thinks they've been abducted and is considering hypnosis or guided imagery to recover their buried memories of the event. Is this really something you want to remember? It's just dangerous. They're screaming in many cases. They're crying. They're rolling on the floor. What emerges in their hypnotic sessions feels intensely real to them. Dr. Susan Clancy, a psychologist and an expert in memory, has spent six years studying UFO abductees. She believes that abduction memories are not recovered in therapy. They're created there. Every abductee I worked with obtained their memories through hypnosis or what they called guided imagery. I don't know anybody that spontaneously developed memories of being abducted by aliens. Abductees often appear rational and sane, and most are acutely aware that their stories sound fantastic. But their argument is, why would anyone choose to remember such horrific events? Later, we'll take a trip into the human psyche to answer this question and get some startling biological answers. And we'll re-examine the Mexican Air Force's amazing infrared footage to see if we can find a more down-to-earth explanation. How did our obsession with UFOs begin? The modern era of UFO watching heated up during the first years of the Cold War, when people were constantly craning their necks skyward on the lookout for spy planes and incoming missiles. 
But the event that really kick-started the craze took place in June 1947. Kenneth Arnold was flying his private plane through the Cascade Mountains in Washington State when he saw a bright blue-white flash in the distance. As he watched, he apparently saw a group of unknown objects weave in and out of the mountain peaks at high speed, flying with incredible agility. Arnold told his story to a local newspaper and the flying saucer craze was born. But later that same year came a landmark UFO event, an incident that still refuses to die, that has its name spoken with reverence by believers and annoyance by skeptics, Roswell. Strange debris was found on a ranch outside of Roswell, New Mexico, near a US Army airfield. The next day, a local paper ran the story, boldly announcing that the Army had an alien spacecraft in its possession. The military quickly countered that the debris was in fact just the remains of a weather balloon. But the damage was already done. It didn't help that the Army was covering something up. The so-called weather balloon was in fact a new spy balloon they'd been secretly testing. It was the beginning of a new era. Post-Roswell, thousands of UFOs had been reported and conspiracy theories spun. There are also photographs and videos, lots of them, some more convincing than others. But when it comes to UFO sightings, few incidents can match the one that occurred in Mexico, where not one, but dozens of people caught something out of this world on videotape. On July 11, 1991, a total eclipse of the sun began to dim the skies over Mexico City. Hundreds of people used their video cameras to capture the event. For UFO researcher Guillermo Araguin, it was a remarkable sight. I went up to my roof to shoot the event. When I saw a shining light in the sky, I focused my camera. I understand that what I filmed is an oscillating UFO, not a planet or a star. Araguin was not alone in what he recorded. Sergio Fuentes was celebrating the eclipse with his family when he too turned towards the sky. My wife and kids insisted that I don't look directly at the sun without wearing any protection. I paid attention to them and I tried to continue filming everything that happened. I kept holding the camera, making sure it was pointing at the sun. Later, when Fuentes checked the tape, he was amazed to discover that he had filmed the UFO. Over the next several days, reports of UFO sightings flooded in, causing a media frenzy. Nationally renowned investigative journalist Jaime Maussan hosted a marathon 10-hour program on UFOs that included a discussion of the sightings. He asked viewers to go back and look at what they'd recorded with their video cameras. When I presented this in television, many people called to say, I saw it. You can see clearly a shining object looks metallic with a black shadow underneath, a silver disc shape object. We uh, believe that this was not a star or some kind of uh, problem with the camera, distortion of the camera. The video is the evidence to prove that this is real. And that day, my life changed completely. Because from that moment on, people wanted me to talk more about UFOs than anything else. But some people find all this evidence less than convincing. Writer and skeptic Mario Mendes Acosta debated Maussan over the 1991 eclipse sightings, and he thinks that the national obsession with UFOs has more to do with Maussan himself than visitations from outer space. Just imagine uh, that your most uh, widely known uh, TV anchorman suddenly became converted into a, a UFO full-time believer. Uh, I think the United States they would have fired him. Uh, it's uh, the complete futility of all these matter, matters that really appalls us. You know? 
Appalling or not, 13 years after the eclipse, Mao San still runs a weekly show, and his devoted viewers continue to send in videos of supposed UFOs. The Mexican people embraced this phenomenon, and they have been able to produce more evidence than any other country in the world. Mexico is now a hotbed of UFO research and a prime location for observing questionable objects in the sky. Groups of amateur ufologists regularly meet at night and try to make contact with the lights in the sky, meditating on them and flashing lights at them. But if the truth about Mexico's UFOs is out there, it may be closer than the stars. It may be in Stockholm. Astronomer and photographer Tom Callan is the producer of a planetarium show at the Swedish Museum of Natural History. A lot of people nowadays don't have an understanding of the night sky. They don't even know some of the basic constellations. And so when they go outside and they see something that's unusual that they don't understand, it's easy to jump to the conclusion that, hey, that funny light in the sky, that's intelligent life, some sort of aliens are piloting some kind of a vehicle, or perhaps they're in the sky, without stopping to think perhaps it's a meteor, or perhaps it's a satellite. Callan believes that the Mexico City UFO witnesses did see something truly awe-inspiring, something beyond the realm of Earth, but not necessarily something under alien control. In the Mexico City video, we see a sky that's already darkened because the eclipse is already in progress. We see a few clouds floating around, and then the camera zooms in on this object. Using a commercially available computer program that plots the sky on any given day from any given point on Earth, Tom will recreate what happened in the skies over Mexico that day. Here's the sun about to be eclipsed by the moon. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and run the program forward at about 30 times normal speed so that you're able to see what is happening during this eclipse event. As the computer imitates the moon passing in front of the sun, the sky darkens and several heavenly bodies brighten. And in the exact spot where the UFO was recorded, an especially bright object emerges. And here we can very clearly see we've got the planet Venus here, which is the, uh, what I'm pretty sure is what the object is that these people in Mexico City uh, photograph. Venus is the second planet from the sun and the brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon. But why does Venus look so much like a blurry alien spacecraft? Tom believes it's the camera itself, in trying to focus on this bright but distant object that creates the three-dimensional effect. Here's Venus in the sky. This looks very much like a uh, zoomed-up image of a planet. Now we have this extreme zoom up here. This, again, has been slowed down quite a bit, and we can see some effects of moving the camera around. That dark line that we're seeing here, that's not the underside of anything in particular. That, what we're seeing is an artifact from the camera. It just takes and makes a common, everyday celestial object look kind of mysterious. But everyday celestial objects can't be responsible for all of Mexico's UFO sightings. Take this remarkable object, for example, seen hovering in the vicinity of the active volcano Popocatapetl. It's clearly not a planet or a star, and it certainly isn't behaving like an aeroplane. The object was captured on video by architect Mario Ramirez, who lives near the volcano. Like many people here, he believes that volcanic activity attracts UFOs to Mexico. And he claims to have seen an entire fleet of ships fly into the crater back in 1988. I saw a very big ship, about 300 meters in diameter. It had a lot of lights and windows. It spun on its center, then advanced towards the volcano. I have seen them go in and come out in groups of 30 at incredible speeds going towards space. They live in the center of the volcano. In 2000, Ramirez was studying a stone formation near the volcano that he believes is a sort of ancient astronomy textbook when something caught his attention. 
haciendo observaciones con el cerro Tlapaltepec. I was here at the rock, making observations of Popo. I set up my camera, and then I saw a flash. And I wondered, why am I seeing a flash from the mountain? What Ramirez eventually recorded is an object that appears to hover over the distant mountain. I looked up, and there was a UFO up in the clouds. I thought that they were trying to communicate with me. It remained aloft for nearly two minutes before disappearing behind the peak. Our professional skeptic, Tom Callan, doesn't think much of this intriguing object. That, to me, looks very much like a zoomed-in image that, for all intents and purposes, is probably a large bird. And if you look at it, it appears to be flapping at the same time, as if there are you know, extensions on it that are flapping. And that's something that I wouldn't expect in, in some kind of a you know, extraterrestrial vehicle of any kind either. Of course, not all unidentified flying objects are simply cases of mistaken identity. Some look suspiciously like cheap old special effects. We turn our attention now to close encounters of the second kind. These are cases where the UFO leaves actual physical evidence behind. We'll be looking at the supposed footprints of a UFO and asking, what on earth could have made them? In September 2004, a series of rings appeared on a small, isolated patch of land near Guadalajara. The landowner called an architect and UFO researcher, Daniel Dominguez, and his team to investigate. They spent a few nights observing the field, and sure enough, a spherical light appeared. It passed directly over us, and its intensity of light went up. Then the light got lower, and it continued its trajectory. Dominguez claims that the light made changes in the grass that could not have been caused by a man-made object. For four weeks now, they've been mapping out the circles and measuring their growth. They're also taking soil samples to test for radiation, which is what Dominguez believes caused the circles. We got this sample on September 17th. As you can see, the grass has a greener tone and the blade's width is bigger than the rest of it. And this shows us that it was subjected to this radiation. From the evidence we've gotten, I'm inclined to think that these circles are products of a light energy that is produced by an object that comes from further away than the stars. But Dr. Laura Guzman thinks the answer may be much more down to earth. She's a mycologist at the University of Guadalajara, Mexico's first lady of fungus, and she's here to explain what fungus has to do with UFOs. This is a, a very big uh, piece of mycelium growing around uh, maybe a piece of wood or root. According to Guzman, this alien evidence can be explained by fungal mycelium. Mycelium grows out from a central point in rings, often called fairy rings. Some fungi will create a ring of dead grass, but others will actually fertilize the grass and cause it to be greener and lusher in the circle than in the surrounding area, especially if it's being fed by rotting organic matter, such as dead tree roots. These pieces of wood is, uh, stimulate the growth of the fungi, and that's why sometimes there are many fairy rings growing because there are wood uh, under the soil. In my scientific opinion, I think that the thing that causes the fairy rings is a fungus, and there is not another explanation. But there are many thousands of fungi found in soil, and only 50 are known to cause these rings. To confirm that this is a fungus responsible for fairy rings, Dr. Guzman takes the sample back to her lab and puts it under the microscope. She looks for a telltale sign, a small protrusion on individual fungal cells, and confirms her suspicions. The fairy rings that we saw today were uh, formed by fungi. But what about Dominguez's claim that these rings were caused by radiation from a UFO? 
Dr. Guzman had the sample tested and found no elevated levels of any radiation. This close encounter of the second kind was in fact nothing more than a mushroom. Mexico is awash with encounters of the first, second, and third kinds. Although the third kind, actual encounters with aliens, almost always involve communication via mental telepathy or flashlights, which makes numbers a bit hard to verify. But curiously, almost no one in Mexico has reported being abducted by aliens. This is in sharp contrast to their neighbors up north. According to some polls, millions of Americans have been taken into UFOs and poked, probed, and even impregnated. Why is there this north-south divide? This sort of thing is a, is a culture-bound belief. I mean, presumably, uh, if aliens are in fact abducting people, they're not simply abducting Americans, uh, but presumably Mexicans and Brazilians and Portuguese uh, at the same rates. I'd be the happiest person in the world if someone would say that this really isn't happening, this is some kind of who knows what, and I'd be very happy, but uh, unfortunately I've been involved for so long. Before we enter the terrifying world of alien abduction, we return to the strange infrared event recorded by a Mexican military aircraft. Nearly a dozen unidentified objects for which the military could find no explanation. Could this be definitive proof of alien visitations? On that historic afternoon in March 2004, a routine military flight became a frantic effort to identify objects that seemed to be flying parallel to the plane. Invisible to radar and the naked eye, they appeared only on infrared sensors. The Mexican military released the infrared records of the flight's encounter with the unidentified objects, creating a sensation in the media. Captain Alejandro Franz of the Mexican UFO research group Alcion decided to investigate for himself. Franz is a sort of skeptical believer. Although he thinks UFOs have visited Earth, he feels that investigators should rule out all alternative explanations before reaching that conclusion. I uh, have been investigating these things because uh, almost 90% uh, of the times they are not UFOs. They are human made or they are planets or asteroids or many other things that can be identified. A pilot himself, Captain Franz wants to recreate the flight path of the military plane and then, at the point where the crew encountered the UFOs, turn the plane directly toward the UFO sightings. He believes that the objects might still be out there. The plane takes off from Via Mosa and climbs to 3,500 meters heading almost due east. The plane reaches the first point of contact with the UFOs. Franz instructs the pilots to head northwest, the same direction as the infrared camera was pointing. He's seen lights out that way before and thinks he knows exactly what the military was tracking. I have been flying and crossing the Gulf of Mexico hundreds of times. These lights in the Gulf of Mexico are seen all the year, almost by night. Any pilot could see them in good weather conditions and good visibility. You could see them 140, 150 miles out. About 100 kilometers from shore and nearly 160 kilometers from the last contact point, Franz spots what he's been looking for, a massive offshore oil well complex known as Cantorel. Even at 4,500 meters, the structures appear enormous. Drilling platforms can be as high as 40 stories. The flames, which can reach huge heights, are caused by burning off excess gas to reduce pressure on the wells. So, they are there. I feel happy because I was confirming my theory is completing 
part of my investigation and it's giving me support to keep in investigating more. Franz is sure that these flames are the source of the infamous UFOs. But could they really have registered some 160 kilometers away on a military plane's infrared surveillance system? And why did they appear to be flying? Jim Seffrin thinks he has the answer. He teaches and certifies infrared technicians and uses the technology himself to examine oil refineries and oil well platforms. First of all, we haven't established that these objects are flying. So, some might get a sense here that the objects are moving. In fact, this is an optical illusion which is created by the clouds moving uh, with respect to the objects, not the other way around. It's likely that what we're seeing is a very hot source of heat. And in this case, since we're out over the ocean, a reflection of that heat off of the surface of the ocean. It could be the flame and some of the smoke, or it could be just the flame. <laughs> I would like to believe that there may be UFOs, but it, I just don't see evidence of that here. It's one thing to refute cold clinical evidence of UFOs captured on video or infrared, but it's another thing entirely to deal with compelling first-hand testimony of contact with aliens, especially if that contact is brutally physical with terrifying implications. What are we to make of people who have vivid memories of being abducted and subjected to bizarre medical and sexual procedures? If abduction scenarios are real, and advocates claim that millions of people show signs that they are, then a sinister threat beyond anything humans can imagine is upon us. For the past 50 years, Thousands of people have come forward to report that they have been abducted by aliens. And abduction proponent David Jacobs thinks this is just the tip of the iceberg, based on a survey he helped to conduct in 1992. If you ask people, have they been abducted, uh, about a million will say yes, but in fact, most people don't know that they've been abducted because the phenomenon is forgotten almost as soon as they return from the event. It would seem that the extraterrestrials try to block people's memories of abduction, but it's an imperfect block. Hypnosis, Jacob says, can unblock those memories. Some people remember parts of abductions, they remember sequences of abductions, and they remember whole abductions. Hypnosis, for reasons that we do not understand, sort of opens the gates and suddenly people start to remember the long-term memory that is remembered in an odd way for the first time. So the only way that they've been able to, to remember this is by getting into a really relaxed, focused psychological state. They all remember remarkably similar events. Pam's experience is typical. She finds herself awake but immobilized in bed. Small gray beings conduct her up to a waiting spacecraft. There, she joins others in a waiting area. Oftentimes, I look around, and I think that the other people that are sitting there look like they're really out of it. And Dr. Jacobs will tell me, well, they're probably looking at you thinking that you're really out of it, too. Sometimes there are lessons. Sometimes there are physical examinations and procedures. The little gray guys are the escorts, and they're just little guys, and they have big eyes, and they're, they're very, very thin. Then there's the taller ones that look like them, um, but are more, more intellectual. Generally, it starts with a staring procedure, and they stare at you, and the staring procedure lasts for a long time, and all you can see generally are these huge eyes, and, and you're lost in it. Sometimes it's an information dump. Sometimes they are, they're doing physical things to you. Sometimes while they're doing that, someone is putting an instrument up, up one's nose or in the ear. And sometimes it's very painful. Sometimes they, um, they botch it. And sometimes things turn truly sinister. 
people uh, have uh, uh, sperm taken, eggs taken, uh, fetuses uh, implanted in them, removed from them. Well, what I believe happens, and, uh, and even at my age happens still, is that they, they take an embryo, which is a combination, once again, of us and, and them, and they insert it in us, and we carry it for um, about 10 weeks, and then they take it out. And then what they do with it, I've seen where they have bottles, these, these big bottles, and then they have, they have these little ones and suspended. Pam is not alone. Thousands of people have reported almost identical memories, awakening to find a light streaming into the bedroom, a feeling of paralysis and terror, levitation and transport to the examining room of a spacecraft by small gray humanoids, and examination by a much taller alien. How can so many people who have never met each other tell such detailed and similar stories? What that does suggest is that there is a common conception of what an alien abduction uh, involves, from films, from TV shows, from written accounts. Uh, so the notion that because these people report similar things, this is an actual shared true experience is, is simply fallacious. There's also the method used to get to the memories, hypnosis. For a long time, hypnosis was thought to provide a near magical window into the memory. But more recently, it's been discovered that hypnosis may be far more effective in creating memories than retrieving them. In a state of hypnosis, people are highly suggestible and eager to please the hypnotist, as anyone who has seen a hypnosis stage act knows. You know what, I, I'm looking right now, this lady right here has your canary. You might want to go and ask for it back. Go and ask her to give you your canary back right now. <laughs> this can be quite entertaining when done in fun, but has the potential to do enormous harm in therapy. Dr. Susan Clancy has spent six years working with people who've recovered memories of UFO abduction while under hypnosis. She's certain that these so-called memories were created in therapy, not uncovered. Recent studies have shown that highly suggestible people will produce whatever memories the hypnotist is asking for. So everyone put your sun cream on now, make sure you cover your arms, cover your arms, cover your face as well. The truth is, you're susceptible to cues that are given to you by the environment or by the hypnotist himself. You might want to wrap your arms around you, you might want to huddle up, you're feeling colder and colder and colder. It's just too difficult because you will develop memories that feel real and neither you nor your therapist will be able to distinguish between whether the memories correspond to uh, reality or not. Jacobs counters that he never leads a patient to recover memories of abduction. Obviously, I, as the hypnotist, am quite aware of those problems. And most people who come to me are aware of those problems as well. They don't want to be led. They don't want to pick up things in popular culture. Once you control for them, once you can understand what the difficulties with hypnosis are, once, once you can, can figure out a, a, a methodology which takes that into account and controls for it, then you begin to get these stories that come out that are just extraordinary. These people that come to them, come to them because they believe that they may have been abducted by aliens, and they believe it enough to go seek out somebody who is going to help them validate this. That's enough right there. But why would people choose to believe that they've been abducted and violated by extraterrestrials? It is possible that they may have come across a popularized abduction checklist, such as this one. Missing time, nightmares about UFOs, sleep disorders, unusual physical sensations, unexplained marks on the body, feelings of being watched. How many of us couldn't answer yes to most of these at some point in our lives? The phenomenon of alien abduction could have its roots in something utterly terrestrial, something biological. Intriguing new evidence is coming to light from sleep research. I tried to fall asleep in my bed for a while. All of a sudden, my body became really stiff. 
Though I was still conscious, I wasn't able to move my body at all. I sensed the presence around me, then felt as though something was right by my feet. I saw an apparition like a pale old woman hunching over it, staring at me. This sounds similar to the early stages of an alien abduction scenario. And with good reason, according to Japanese sleep researcher Dr. Kazuhiko Fukuda. I like UFOs and science fiction, but I'm very doubtful that these things actually exist. Most people who experience alien abduction have a similar experience, waking up in the middle of the night, then realizing that the body can't move. They sense some presence in the room, and the presence is an alien. These basic experiences can all be explained by sleep paralysis. For several years, Dr. Fukuda, a psychophysiologist at Fukushima University in Japan, has been studying sleep paralysis. It's commonly known there as kanashibari, which means bound in metal, and refers to the terrifying sense of immobility that sleep paralysis can induce. Sleep paralysis occurs around REM, or rapid eye movement sleep. Because we dream during REM sleep, the brain temporarily disconnects our ability to move, so we won't act out our dreams and perhaps injure ourselves. It's an ingenious mechanism. But if the brain fails to reconnect once you begin to emerge from sleep, you'll awake and feel paralyzed. In a sleep laboratory at the university, Dr. Fukuda attempts to recreate sleep paralysis. He attaches electrodes to the heads of subjects to monitor brainwave activity as they sleep. There is a noticeable difference between the brain waves of the dream state of normal REM sleep and the kanashibari state of REM sleep. What we found is that the kanashibari state of REM sleep is very similar to the state when people are awake. So when someone actually experiences sleep paralysis, they feel like they're awake. After the subjects reach the correct REM stage, somewhere between dreaming and waking, Dr. Fukuda interrupts their sleep. Then he asks questions about what they were feeling at that moment. Many say that they were dreaming, and some report experiences that are consistent with sleep paralysis. I could not move my hands. I felt like they were paralyzed. Some people see hallucinations. For example, they feel some weight on their chest or stomach, and when they open their eyes, something is sitting on them or standing by their feet. Some hear strange sounds or sometimes feel like their body is floating. Dr. Clancy finds Dr. Fukuda's results compelling. In her six-year study of abductees, every subject developed his or her beliefs after describing an episode that is consistent with a Kanashibari-type sleep paralysis. You wake up in the middle of the night, um, you're unable to move, so you feel paralyzed, but you can still see things and hear things. And people will report seeing shadowy figures in the room or feeling like they're levitating. So you have dream mentation. It's kind of like getting into your waking state. So maybe the, the images that you were dreaming about are there in your room. As Dr. Clancy and Dr. Fukuda note, different interpretations given to sleep paralysis reflect the different cultures in which they occur. Kanashibari has been widely accepted in Japan. In the 1700s, the British feared a demonic incubus that attacked women as they lay in bed, unable to move. In Newfoundland, the condition is called Old Hag and takes the form of a frightening old witch that sits on the chest of the sleeper. In China, it's been known for centuries as ghost oppression. In Zanzibar, it's Popabawa, a flying cycloptic dwarf. For a present-day American culture awash in UFO beliefs, perhaps it's natural for sleep paralysis to be interpreted as alien abduction. But the question still remains. What could anyone gain from believing something so terrifying that aliens had abducted and violated them? What 
is not often talked about is that there are huge positive benefits, that there is uh, something bigger than us, something technologically superior that's out there. And it gives people a new outlook on their lives and the purpose of their lives and the world we live in. And that is an enormous benefit that I don't think has been really uh, touched on by abduction researchers. I think they're sort of tone deaf to the positive benefits occurred from these experiences. As time goes on, close encounters of all kinds seem to be plaguing us with increasing frequency. This doesn't necessarily mean they're genuine. After all, if aliens want to be seen, why not land at Buckingham Palace or the White House? And if they don't want us to know that they're here, wouldn't they have developed the technology to hide from us? Wouldn't their mind blocks be impervious to our primitive hypnosis techniques? But then again, could so many people really be wrong? There's a goal to this program, and what they say it is, is an integration into the society, not necessarily by the gray aliens, but by these hybrid beings who look quite human. What if these creatures are real? What if all these videos are telling us that our planet is being observed? You see, you have to really try to open your mind. The striking lack of evidence tells me that much of what people believe about UFOs and alien abductions is, is uh, cultural, it's psychological. It's not out there, it's in here. Is the truth out there? Is there, in fact, a down-to-earth explanation for UFOs? Or are they truly out of this world? <laughs>